Um, good morning. Welcome. Very glad to have you this morning at our um, distinguished lecture. I'm Anna Siefkin with the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University and very excited to have you here with our special guests. So the Scott Institute, as many of you know, um, is the energy hub for research at Carnegie Mellon University. So we focus on collaborative research, thought leadership, strategic partnerships, education, entrepreneurship, and policy. Um, and it's all in an effort towards a sustainable, lower carbon energy future. So we do a lot of programming like this. Uh, we do have an annual report, if you'd like to know more about us. And we have uh, major focus areas in energy with about 150, almost 160 energy researchers focusing on technology, efficiency, and computation. So you can check out our annual report, which is on the front page of our website, which is cmu.edu forward slash energy. So the purpose of our Distinguished Lecture Series, obviously, is ordinarily in person, and we have gone to virtual this fall, is to really just uh, talk about some deep insights into our energy future. So we focus with, on our most esteemed partners for those lectures. Um, we have some other virtual programming that's coming up, including a session tomorrow. It's a webinar focused on Pittsburgh's startups. So we have three startups that are tied to Carnegie Mellon that are talking about the challenges and barriers that they have um, in starting those, um, those companies. Uh, we have another webinar. It's actually a forum that we're doing with the Tepper School of Business this Friday, which is technology, sustainability, and business. Um, a very esteemed guest on December 3rd, Rita Barinwall, who's the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy from the Department of Energy on the 3rd. And then on December 10th, those of you who are interested in all things Pittsburgh, we're actually talking about the city of the future. So hopefully you can join us. Um, a special note also um, that our featured guest today, Denise, um, uh, Denise Gray, was the Lifetime Achievement Award at the C3E Symposium last year. So this year's C3E Symposium is on uh, December 8th and 9th, and hoping you can join. There's information about registering uh, for that event. It's a virtual event. And then finally, save the date. Many of you have asked about Energy Week. We are doing a virtual Energy Week in March of 2021 from the 22nd to the 26th. So if you have suggestions for an upcoming webinar or speaker, you can send those over to my colleague, Danielle Agreement. There are lots of ways to get involved with Carnegie Mellon to sort of track and follow what we're up to or to send us suggestions. Uh, so please do drop us a line or check our website. Special thank you today to LG Kim um, Tech Center out of Michigan um, for the participation of these incredible panelists today. So with that, I wanna do a couple of quick introductions. I'm gonna take us off of screen share. So Mohammed and Greg, if you wanna put your screens back up so we can see everyone. Um, a special thank you again to Denise Gray. Denise is the president of LG Chem Michigan Inc. Tech Center, which is the North American subsidiary of lithium ion battery maker LG Chem Korea. In this position, she leads the team of more than 150 people who provide electrification solutions to the transportation industry. Denise holds several board of directors positions, including at LG's BMI, Teneco Automotive, the Original Equipment Supplier Association, and the Board of the Energy and Environmental Systems in Washington, D.C. She, she has a 30-year career um, at General Motors, where she spearheaded efforts in vehicle, electri electrical, vehicle electrical and powertrain systems controls and software, including battery systems. Thank you so much for being here, Denise. Um, our second guest today is Gregory Smith, who's a systems manager at LG Chem with extensive experience with vehicle development, focusing on controls, calibration, validation, and integration, as well as uh, part design and release. Um, Greg is a technical expert on electrical vehicle battery systems design and integration, and has had tremendous success in leading high profile projects and developing new business relationships. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Mohammed Almajar, who serves as Director of Research at LG Chem Michigan, Inc. Um, so he is, has over 25 years of experience in his current position, where he is primarily responsible for research development and engineering of CPI battery cells. Um, so prior to joining CPI, he was the Research Manager for High Energy Technologies and Rechargeable Battery Industries um, 
where he worked on improving lithium ion technology for commercial use. So thank you to all of our special guests today. I do want to mention that we're also joined today by one of our esteemed battery experts, Jay Whitaker, who is the trustee professor in energy engineering and public policy and a material science and engineering, um, as well as the director of the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. And with that, Denise, I'm going to put it over to you um, and let you make a few comments. Thank you so very much. What a wonderful opportunity to uh, be with you all today. So I wanted to start off with, I've got a few comments I wanted to make. Um, and then I wanted to engage my colleagues because I quite frankly with um, being at home, I love to be able to interact with other people. And I thought instead of just me lecturing, it'd be great to just have a group uh, event and quite frankly, those guys are extremely smart, and I think they will be, uh, you will be beneficial, benefit, benefit, uh, benefactoraries. I can't even talk today, uh, based on these uh, these colleagues of mine. I've got four points that I wanted to bring to your attention today. Um, I want to talk about electrification because it really is the the real deal uh, when it comes to the vehicle and really changing the industry um, today. I want to talk about the market and where we're going and what the volumes and the forecasts are for electrified powertrains for battery electric and plug-in electric vehicles. I want to talk about um, requirements. What are the challenging requirements before us? And then last but not least, I want to talk about innovation because you out there in this audience, I think will help us to move from where we are today to where we want to go tomorrow. And I want to just put out there and shine a light on some of the challenges we have so that you can help and be a part of making this industry uh, the best it possibly can be. So first of all, electrification. Um, being an electrical engineer uh, at General Motors way back when and many decades ago, uh, sometimes I felt like I was the lone wolf in, in the room because most of the engineers around me were mechanical engineers. And I being an electrical engineer was really interested in uh, microprocessors and where was the industry going and what are the enablers to, to really take this very maybe mechanical world to where it possibly can be. And so I uh, began working in this area of um, electrifying the vehicle from brake systems to steering systems, to automatic lighting systems, to uh, remote uh, keyless entry systems, uh, bringing mobile mobility uh, when it comes to cell phones into the vehicle. And one of the last frontiers that I had not worked on at General Motors was batteries. And um, when I was uh, made aware that they were looking for uh, uh, an executive to be in charge of uh, our battery uh, technology area, really pulling together our, our research and development, our advanced and production teams, along with the supply base, I raised my hand and say, I'll do it. At least I put in my put my name in the hat for an opportunity to interview for the role, and I got it. And I'm telling you, a whole world opened when it came to moving electrification into the powertrain area. Now that wasn't the first time we had been electrifying the powertrain for many years with all kinds of sensors and actuators and microprocessors and control systems. But the battery was one of the last components in my mind to really take that next leap of technology. And so we began going down that path, uh, moving from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion technology, um, really starting off with the mild hybrids. And our thought was we'll enter into the mild hybrid uh, realm, maybe about a hundred volt system first, and then we'll move into higher voltage systems later. Um, but the perfect storm happened and the technology was ready. And we moved into not just the mild hybrid, uh, the, the, the lower voltage systems, but we moved into a higher voltage system at the time, at the same time. And uh, the Chevrolet Volt, which uh, all three of us actually worked on, uh, I was at GM, Greg Smith was at GM, Mohammed Alamgir was at LG at, here in the United States. And we worked together to bring that technology into fruition. And so I just wanted to just mention the various 
levels of electrification when it comes to adding batteries as a major contributor, enabler, and maybe even complete substitution for uh, the internal uh, combustion engine. So we've got our, our mild hybrid, which we talk about like a 48 volt system. Uh, it had gone up to maybe a hundred volt system. Then we've got our full hybrid, like you see in a Prius or a Ford Focus. Um, then you've got your plug-in hybrids, which now, and, and, and every time I talk about the next step, the battery gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So our plug-in hybrids, which we maybe can take you maybe uh, a 400 volt system that can take you maybe 40 miles uh, before um, it depletes its uh, capacity. And then the entire full battery electric vehicle where there's no internal combustion engine and it's the battery, which is the major, uh, the primary uh, source of energy in the total vehicle to propel the vehicle, quite frankly, in collaboration with the electric motors and the drive system. So the various uh, uh, levels of electrification. But the electrification um, that really is making a big difference is the plug-ins and the full battery electric vehicles. And those are the systems which now I'm gonna talk about and move to the market, what we're forecasting when it comes to the market over a number of different years. Now, just like uh, you, we get our data from IHS. So I attribute this data uh, to IHS, but uh, some of the stats currently in 2020, uh, when I talk about plug-in and battery electric vehicle, we're about 2% globally, globally around the world. Um, I'm sorry, that was in 2018. 2020, we're about 5%. So we've made some, some improvements uh, some increases over the last couple of years. So today, 5%. The projections for 2023 is about 12% and 16% by 2025. And some are looking at somewhere upwards to uh, 30% by 2030, a decade from now. And so we are really in the steep part of the curve when it comes to uh, increasing volume uh, for plugins and full electric vehicles. Now, mind you, there are still uh, 48 volt systems that are also uh, uh, increasing over time, as well as the full hybrid systems. But when I talk about just the plug-ins and the battery electric, uh, those are um, really making strides. So um, maybe 16% by 2025 and, and upwards about 25 to 30% by 30, uh, 2030. Where is, in the world, is this volume increasing the most? Uh, right now, we are seeing that uh, come mid-century, uh, mid, uh, yeah, mid, mid uh, of this decade, 2025, that Europe is really making an increase. And there's a number of different reasons, but primarily there are some very strong CO2 reduction requirements. And therefore, um, the European uh, companies and all the companies uh, are really striving to increase the penetration of plug-ins and battery electric vehicles uh, in Europe. China is not far behind. In fact, many will say that they are probably neck and neck when it comes to the penetration, but the forecast in 2025 is about 21%. Here in the US, the projections are less, 10%. Now you may uh, wonder why that's the case. Uh, there's probably a number of different reasons, but. Uh, it really goes down to what the legislation, what is the, uh, the push from the government when it comes to uh, CO2 requirements. And Europe is really pushing, China's pushing when it comes to that, as well as uh, really trying to make strides in this new technology area. And the US, uh, albeit the penetration is smaller, um, lots of work has happened in the United States to really be able to sell vehicles, not only in the United States and meet the requirements, but also the US automakers also sell vehicles in Europe and also in China. So everyone's in the game. The question is where will our country be when it comes to the penetration? But those are uh, the areas. So upward, upward, upward is where the, the market is going when it comes to uh, plugins and uh, battery electric vehicles. What are, the, next, the third item I want to talk about, what, what are the driving requirements? range, especially for battery electric vehicles. If you think about most of us have, uh, have had or uh, still have uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle. 
And so we can probably go about 300 miles on a full tank of gas. Uh, some of the newer vehicles that have um, some of the mild hybrid uh, technology uh, on board may even go up to 500 miles uh, on a full tank of gas. And so uh, that is the challenge when it comes to electrified powertrains or full battery electric vehicles. Uh, the consumer is pretty, pretty much trained to be able to go at least 300 miles uh, on that full tank of gas. And so therefore they wanna go on a um, 300 miles on a full battery. And so that has been one of the, um, the major milestones when it comes to the range of a full electric vehicles. Can I go 300 miles before I have to uh, fill up again? And so that is our challenge. And many of the vehicles today, uh, the LG Chem technology has made great strides in being able to meet that requirement when it comes to 300 miles range. Um, but uh, some say that there is still more. Uh, some say that's the sweet spot. We will see. Our car makers know our customers and they will uh, help direct us to what is that right uh, range for our, our, our customers. The second one is faster charge. And I say faster charge because some people recognize with a full better electric vehicle or plug-in, the good part of this is if you have a home or if you have a workplace that's got a charging system, you can actually charge at home or charge at the workplace. And so it may eliminate me from having to kind of go to the, uh, the fueling stations on the corner or a couple of miles away from my house. And some people recognize that you may be able to charge every day. And therefore that, uh, that full range might not even be, uh, 300 miles might not even be necessary. But that really is one of the, um, the requirements that we're striving to meet uh, the needs of our customers. Do they want to be able to um, uh, charge uh, maybe an 80% from zero to 80% uh, state of charge? Do they wanna get there in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes? Of course, uh, the smaller the number, the better is what most people say, but there is a balance of requirements and cost and life when it comes to uh, charging. And so that becomes one of the other, uh, and I say my top two requirements when it comes to all of us who are developing uh, battery systems for vehicle companies, transportation companies. Um, how, how far can I go on that full, uh, on, on a charge? And then how fast will it take me to recharge uh, my vehicle? And so those are the two areas that we, we look at when it comes to really uh, guiding our requirements. The third one is cost, but I'll let Jay ask us about that in our questions and answers, because that one's always a lot of fun. Let me go to the challenges um, uh, from an innovation perspective. And I have to say that um, the battery industry, the automotive industry, I have to give great credit to our Department of Energy and the consortium that comes together around batteries, uh, our research laboratories, Argonne National Labs, um, uh, they've done a great job in really bringing this country, this industry into um, developing technology for automotive uh, systems and transportation systems. And in fact, I might say, and maybe it's my own personal opinion, if it wasn't for the Department of Energy and the US ABC, the United States uh, Advanced Battery Consortium, I would say we might not be where we are today uh, developing this technology. And I say that because when groups of people with a singular purpose comes together to develop and innovate, amazing things happen. And I would say probably um, in the, at the start of uh, this century, say uh, in, in 2000, in year 2000, the battery prices were extremely high, probably not even affordable without subsidies uh, for the, the working uh, person. But with through the development, of these consortiums. And, and that consortium from the DOE is comprised of uh, members from General Motors, Ford, FCA, uh, and the Department of Energy, um, along with bringing suppliers like LG Chem, and, and I would even name uh, others, um, 8123 out of MIT, uh, Johnson Controls, um, a number of different uh, suppliers uh, to really come together as a singular team to understand what are the challenges and how can we come together with development programs to continue to develop and, and uh, solve those challenges? 
And today, I think they've done a remarkable job. The costs have come down considerably, probably 75% uh, of, of the cost in 2000 is where we are today, probably. Um, the technology as far as range, even lithium ion in its use cycle um, has been further developed with all those people putting their heads together to understand what the problem is and develop a means to solve those problems. Uh, new technology has been developed and licensed out of our national labs, quite frankly, as a result of just that great teamwork and collaboration that has occurred. And so, um, but the challenges are still at hand. Um, everyone's still looking for um, more energy density, um, uh, longer life, and uh, the cell technology is still under development um, and making great strides from uh, more different cathode materials, different anode materials, electrolyte separators, um, all types of uh, innovation when it comes to the cells. Uh, the modules, which is a group of cells put together, if you will, um, more technology and, and innovations needed to try to lightweight that module as best, how to thermally control it uh, as best. Everyone knows, or many people know, that the Achilles heel of a battery is temperature, just like electronics, if you will. And so if we can develop technology that's temperature tolerant, then maybe we can uh, decontent the battery pack. Uh, maybe we can allow it to last longer. And so I put that challenge out there for thermally controlled uh, materials that allow us to, um, to maintain the sweet spot of, of temperature that batteries would like to see. And last but not least, the battery, the, without least, the battery pack. And uh, these battery packs, especially with full battery electric vehicles, they can be as big, uh, the mass can be as much as uh, 500, 600 pounds. So that's a lot of mass inside a vehicle. And quite frankly, we all, all know that uh, force equals uh, MA. And so if we can reduce that mass, we can move a lot faster. And so, and therefore we can also, um, ensure that we, our energy is more efficient. So we're always looking for a lightweighting material uh, to house these batteries uh, within the vehicle or within the transportation entity in order to uh, allow ourselves to, um, to reduce the energy needed to move uh, uh, um, something from point A to point B. So those are my, uh, my four points that I wanted to make. And I think I'm looking at my time and I think I was just right there in the right spot. So just in, in, in summary, um, span of electrification is from mild hybrids, full hybrids, full electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. The market seems to say, according to IHS, that by 2030, we might be up to 25, 30% of plug-ins and, and full battery electric in the industry around the world where Europe, China seems to be the leaders when it comes to the amount of volume in those locations and the US uh, in third. Range, fast charge and continue to innovate is what my message is for all of us today. Thank Great, you. thank you so much, Denise. This was a, a fantastic uh, a talk. I, you can hear me, right? I just wanna make sure. Good, yes. okay, thank you. Uh, it was fantastic uh, uh, overview, uh, and we're so pleased that you have taken some time out of your busy schedule to to, uh, to tune in here to Carnegie Mellon and the Scott Institute, uh, which I'm very proud to be uh, the director of. Uh, so we talked a little bit uh, about the, the four key things that we met as a group beforehand and wanted to sort of do a deep dive with two of your superstar uh, uh, collaborators. Those four things are market engineering, manufacturing, and innovation. And you, you sort of, you, you went through all of this. I think your market um, piece uh, covered, I think, a lot of the, the key things already. So I'm going to skip market um, and I'm going to maybe pass it over to, to you and your team to answer, I think, uh, a high level question about engineering. And it's this, uh, what are the biggest engineering challenges to EV expansion? Um, are there new technologies that are going to help move those bars uh, significantly? Or is this just sheer incremental innovation learning curve, supply chain uh, optimization, and so forth. Sure, and then I'll ask Mohammed and Greg to, to pipe in as well. Yeah. I would say um, one of the first ones is cost. And, and when I say cost, it's gonna point towards your manufacturing improvements, technology improvements. Um, in order to really move, we need to be able to make sure that the battery is at a good price, 
where the vehicle uh, integration is affordable for the buying customer. The buying customer at the end of the day is the one that we're trying to please. And so if we can continue to reduce the cost of the battery technology, it supports the, the, the OEMs, uh, the vehicle makers to be able to provide uh, affordable vehicles uh, that people wanna buy. And so that's one of the first ones, but some of the enablers around the cost reduction is manufacturing. And I'm really, really excited about a, a joint venture that's recently occurred here in the United States between LG Chem and General Motors. And they're coming together um, to create a manufacturing of battery cells in Ohio. And I think this is awesome because as we know, uh, the, the automakers have been in the business of manufacturing vehicles for over hundred years. And LG Chem, although we've been in the business of manufacturing product, it's been on the consumer side and being a sub supplier in the last 10 years, we've been providing batteries for automotive industry. But quite frankly, if we can combine our 10 years of experience with General Motors, 100 years of manufacturing automotive product, I am so excited about where that's going to lead us. I think there is some cost reduction based on those um, coming together from a manufacturing uh, rules and processes and controls and supply chain maturity. I think that is one of the enablers when it comes to um, reducing the cost and then making electrification scale up a lot faster. And Other areas are in the areas of, uh, and I'll say this in the, in the order of, of cell technology. Mm -hmm. And maybe Mohammed can talk about the technology, um, what places where that may go. You're muted, Mohammed. You need to unmute yourself. You're muted. I'm sorry. I'm not used to all the Zoom technologies, you know. So, <laughs> so Denise captured the mother of all challenges, the cost. So whenever we face the customer, that is the number one beating we take. So the cost is one of the biggest drivers, no matter which customer or which partner we work with. Uh, she also mentioned mentioned the manufacturing manufacturing uh, you know, technology. Uh, so pr production is a big one, manufacturing technology. But I, given my uh, uh, experience with this technology, Jay and the team, uh, the quality control technologies, anything that can help aid in quality control detection of you know uh, 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 failures and things like this, are also can go a long way. Other things then that uh, are from the cell technology part is recharging capability, the charging capability. As you know, you know there's more and more push. When we first started GM Volt uh, with Denise, nobody even talked about what kind of a charge that we should be worried about, right? Hey, charge, because the benchmark was lead acid. You know, you one night charge, things like that. All on a sudden comes EV, everybody is, benchmarking lithium ion technologies with gas engines, you know, five minute charging uh, experience. So this is a new paradigm that has been shoved onto us. And that is a big challenge as, as everyone knows from lithium ion tech. So that's a big two things I wanted to highlight from the cell technology part was in production part the and the recharge part. The, nobody really complains about the durability that much uh, we do handsomely uh, reach these cycle life targets. Of course, everyone knows there is this always underlying theme of safety part. You know, how can you improve the abuse tolerance of this technology, not only the cell part, but the module and pack level. So these are the three or four key other enablers from my vantage point. Greg, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, I think Mohammed covered that. The only thing I would probably add is um, is cooling. As Mohammed mentioned and Denise mentioned, right, one of the keys to mobility and one of the keys to getting people to adopt an EV, and Mohammed just touched on it briefly, is fast charge. And people are used to a refill time to go your 300 miles back to the, you know, you got five minutes and now <clears throat> you want to do fast charge and everyone wants to go keep pushing and pushing and pushing the standards. 
um, you do then run into some very interesting thermal constraints because a large EV battery usually has enough thermal mass that in normal operation, you're not stressing it and you need very little uh, cooling. In fact, there's roles for multiple technologies and I see someone, uh, Bob Madigan asked in the chat, do we see the role of thermoelectric technology? And, and yeah, we're looking at all types of cooling or heating technologies. In fact, we've done multiple different uh, types, whether that's at a module or pack level here at LG. And I think one of the biggest challenges to get adoption is, is not only being able to get that fast charge, but then as well, being able to pull the heat out either during or after um, so that you have the, so you have that range at your disposal and uh, you can get out of the, and you can get out of that, um, those troublesome points of, of having either your battery pack too hot or trying to charge it when it's too cold. Uh, so that the thermal control can't be underestimated and thermal systems honestly keep increasing in complexity as we try to deal with those challenges. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I have a, a refine, I, I wanna refine this a little bit more before we move on. Um, sure. And it, it, not 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 specifically what you were just talking about, but generally the, sort of the, the how to reduce the cost through engineering sort of broader thing. And one of the one of the things that I've published on a little bit and done research on is you know the front to back cost of battery manufacturing. And I think most people would agree that the materials inside a you know a battery cell plus a pack is somewhere between seventy five and eighty five dollars per kilowatt hour, roughly speaking. Uh, that's just for the materials and, and all the stuff. And so everything else on top of that is the cost of manufacturing, the you know the overhead, the time, the whatever profit, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so my open question really to, to any of you guys is, is do you guys think about this as two separate things? I want to reduce the materials cost even more, and I want to reduce the manufacturing cost. Are you guys attacking manufacturing more uh, to reduce that overhead a little bit? Uh, I mean, or is it yes, all of the above? And Specifically, maybe you could talk about the transition to new cathode materials that have slightly higher capacity, like the 811 chemistry. So I'll handle the easy one. Um, are we looking at uh, both of those entities from the manufacturing overhead to the cost of the materials? The answer is yes, yes, and yes, Right. <laughs> for that's sure. Right. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's, that's one of the beauties, the beauties of um, the consortium. Um, they've outlined those uh, this, the details of where they think the costs are, mm -hmm. and it allows uh, the highlighting of those opportunities. And so the answer is yes, yes, yes. In fact, that's why I'm, I'm <laughs> again, I'm really excited about uh, some of the work that I think is going to come out of the GM and the LG joint venture, because I think they're going to attack the manufacturing side of that as a a more um, collective, uh, inclusive entity. And I know even I think in the DOE, I think they had a project they were gonna be focusing on as far as uh, manufacturing as well. So I think, yes, some of the manufacturing techniques um, have been around a long time when it comes to batteries. In fact, you can go to other uh, industries and you'll see that they look very similar. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about um, the manufacturing side of that. And I think uh, those of us in here in the United States, where we do a lot of manufacturing and there's a lot of knowledge when it comes to manufacturing techniques and processes and discipline. Um, Mohammed mentioned quality control. You really want your yields to be extremely high in order to be able to make profits in these areas. And I think uh, coming together in those areas and bringing in more thoughts and idea leaders in this area is gonna be good. And then yes, on this on the material side as well. And Mohammed, I'll let you talk about the material side uh, on some of the ideas and thoughts and areas to focus on in the material reduction, cost reduction. Yes, so let me give my two cents, uh, Jay. Uh, what is it, lithium ion is almost like 30 years, right? So uh, let us say it is a, what, more than almost like 160 years old. So, you, you, many of us have followed what uh, you know, the Tesla guys in their battery day announced. I think they announced almost like $50 per kilowatt hour. That is an astronomical number. I mean, it's this amazing number they have uh, pushed. So that has actually is pushing everyone else towards the target. Uh, it's unheard of. Uh, the, the rapid uh, decrease of lithium ion battery costs it just literally unprecedented. Having said that, even in my, you know, my experience with the Gregs and these also, or I, you know, whenever, whenever we were pushed by US ABC to have 
you know, $150 or $200 per kilo or target. I said, what are these guys doing? Are they smoking pot or whatever it is? Because it seemed like, you know, really impossible to attain that target. But we have made significant, significant uh, improvement with respect to the cost. And then, like I said, Tesla has put this uh, target uh, uh, in front of everyone. And that is a challenge not only from the material perspective, and you have heard, you know, going to very, very low cost material, you know, bringing uh, uh, raw material directly, vertically integrating, going to, you know, just raw sand or silicon, whatever you call it, as well as, the, as, well as itself, the production technologies, which are really bringing down the cost, you know, so, uh, you know, like Denise mentioned, and you mentioned, it is a combination of all these aspects together that is going to really drive the cost down to an unprecedented level. Great, thank you so much. And so it's a unified front, all, all things uh, together. Before I ask the next question, I just want to verify, when you, when, uh, Denise, when you speak of the joint venture, you're talking about Lordstown, right? Yes, absolutely, Lordstown, Ohio. Yeah, can, real quickly, can you give us a sense of what's happening there right now? Uh, I mean, the, the, I drive by that fac factory not infrequently when I drive to Ohio to visit relatives. Uh, I was so happy when it was reopened a little bit, but how many people are working there? What's happening? So very interesting. Um, actually, there's two activities happening in Lordstown. So first, I think the building that you're referencing, actually GM sold that to um, another company. Uh -huh. um, and so they are actually making an electric pickup truck right. in that facility. Right, that's it, um, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and thank goodness they're using LG Chem cells, by the way, on, in that one. But we're actually, the LG GM joint venture is still a, a, a greenfield. They're actually gonna build mm -hmm. another facility where they're gonna actually build a, a battery manufacturing facility in Lordstown as well. And Will that's, it be right next to the factory? Is it like right there or is it just like I, I, I don't think it's that far away. It's in Lordstown proper, but I don't think it, I'm not sure exactly the footprint. And they're still working through the design, the procurement, um, but that's going to be the new manufacturing uh, brown, uh, greenfield uh, facility for battery cell technology. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. I, I, didn't, I didn't recognize that there was, uh, I knew that that Lordstown was a separate entity, but I thought everyone was sharing that same property. So nope. there's actually two properties. That's actually really great. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, more jobs. <laughs> yeah, more job. Well, that's right. And that's what this is about, right? On top of a lot of other things, uh, you know, we're going to save the world and employ more people. Which I think is the great. company's called a workhorse or something like that, right? That bought Lord's, the, 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 yeah. the formerly known yeah, as GM Lordstown. Lordstown. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, we, we want to leave uh, about, you know, at, in five minutes, we want to transition over to, to questions from the audience. Uh, but I have one more to throw out to you guys, which is th that of innovation. We've talked a little bit about innovation, the need for engineering, but so far, a lot of it sounds a bit more like incremental improvement, increasing yields, uh, QA, you know, innovating in terms of, uh, you know, putting in the next generation of, of cathode materials and so forth. Um, what do the next five to 10 years look like? Are there any step improvements you guys are looking at? Some people talk about solid state chemistry. Some people talk about uh, other methodologies that allow for extremely fast charging or whatever. Um, do you have, are you planning anything substantial into your you know, 10 year uh, a world or is it really, hey, we're gonna lock in these batteries and just cost them down for a decade or more? I think it's both. I think it's both and. I think we uh, continue to um, uh, make the incremental changes because there still seem to be some more, um, some more opportunity for reduction, although maybe not the same <laughs> reduction we had before, because uh, as we go down that curve, so, so yes, we'll continue to go down the current one, but um, OG Chem, one of the reasons why I really uh, 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 am fortunate to be a part of the company, they spend quite a bit of money in R&D in uh, looking out another decade or two from now. And they are looking at different revolutionary technologies that may uh, still be in the energy solutions uh, uh, entity, may not be lithium ion. Uh, don't see what that is right now, but they still continue to, to uh, partner with other innovative companies. Uh, we've got uh, a group out in uh, California as well as around the world that's looking for, you know, just doing technology scouting just like everyone is, right. um, to see what is that next next. 
Um, and also, and I, and I, I wouldn't um, forget about working with the vehicle companies. And, and maybe I, I, I can't help it because that's where my roots are in the vehicle side. But amazing things happen when it comes to the integration of technology into vehicles. Um, I worked on projects where, uh, for example, um, we had, uh, I, I'll just say, uh, electronic throttle control from years ago, where we used to be a mechanical cable that ran, and when you touched your accelerator, it kind of moved some things. And I lived through the generation where we took that mechanical linkage away and made it electronic, and we up-integrated things into the vehicle for a more um, efficient way to... Um, to have that function and give you more features and functions, more fuel economy gains, more control. I still think there is partnerships with OEMs and I, and I hope the OEMs don't uh, stop doing this, working with the suppliers to figure out, well, what else can we do to integrate that battery function, that energy storage function into the vehicle? So it's not just a standalone, add it to the vehicle, attach it to the vehicle kind of uh, phenomena. I'm, 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 I, I venture to say that they will be um, activities to integrate that battery into the vehicle in a way that allows it to be lighter weight or uh, reduce any uh, um, uh, efficiency reductions as we process data uh, or energy throughout uh, getting to the wheels. I think there's some opportunity there too. And Greg has worked in vehicle integration for a while. He may have some thoughts around that one as well. Yeah, thanks, Denise. And there are a lot of innovations going on that way at, at pretty much every major automaker because uh, because the goal there is to reduce the scar mass, right? So if you have a full vehicle structure that stands by itself and a full battery structure that stands by itself, that's just putting excess weight into the car, which ultimately detracts from your range. And the whole thing you want to do is to go further. So, so lightweighting technologies and better integrating up into the vehicle structure, which means typically partnering with a supplier like us or anybody early, early, early on. You know, it's it's a lot of times a automaker will come to you the last minute and say, this is the space I got. We got to put whatever we can get and get the most energy in there. And that is a fantastic play to convert existing uh, vehicle infrastructure and existing product lines and convert them over to an electric or a plug-in electric and that's been done successfully throughout the industry and i think it's a you know that's that's like a step one and then you start looking at the purpose-built bevs that have more structurally integrated battery packs where that load is being carried both by the pack and the car uh, and then you can you know there is a nice sweet spot there from a cost optimization as well as advanced materials and light weighting, right? And, and I know we've looked at, you can do stamped steel and you can do aluminum and you can do composites and all those come with specific sets of trade-offs. Um, you know, whether that could be a, a crash worthiness and, and, and impact resistance, you know, there's flammability concerns, there's uh, propagation and safety concerns. So you, you really have to look at the whole package. And so the earlier you get in and you get in these purpose built uh, vehicles that are designed to have a battery compartment, right? Battery compartments don't exist in a car. You have a trunk, you have an engine compartment. No one has the mental thing of a battery compartment and we don't package them in the front because that'd be a bunch of really heavy mass that's way up high and strong. And so the more chance that you have to work early around in the development cycle uh, is, is gives you better chances of getting integration, reducing that scar mass and therefore having a product that's way more mass efficient and more energy efficient. Great, thank you. All right, so we have about 15 minutes. We have more questions than we could possibly address in that time already, but please keep uh, uh, hit, hitting us up with questions. We can see them uh, either in the chat or in the Q and A, but I'm gonna take the moderator's uh, prerogative and ask one that I'm not seeing yet that I'm, I'm curious about personally, and that is uh, recycling. Are you guys doing, maybe I'll talk about second life use or end of life ease of manufacturing the materials or the cells. Um, do, are you doing any uh, purpose uh, design or manufacturing for end of life, uh, end of first life, I should say, uh, um, utilization or recycling? Or is this something that's sort of beyond the horizon right now in terms of uh, you guys are making them, they go in the cars, someone else owns the cars, and someone else's job is to recycle? Excellent question. Thank you, Jay, for bringing that one up because I, again, shine in the light on an area where I think there's opportunity. Yeah. So, first of all, um, it's interesting when when we started talking about recycling or second uh, secondary use back in 2008 9 time frame 
everyone says good topic, brainstorm some ideas, but you know, let's think about that 15 years from now because these batteries are gonna last forever, but the situation might be different. We got uh, some preliminary thoughts, but let's work on it later. Now is later. And so <laughs> right now is why we need to do more work in that area. Um, it's kind of, um, it, it's not, it, no one's pointing the finger at who's responsible for this. It's a little bit soft right now, but LG Kim wants to be a part of the solution. We've got some internal work going on to, to, fig to figure out, number one, how do we design for reuse and remanufacturing so that it gives an opportunity for more life. If you will, when, when a vehicle, um, from a, an emissions perspective or fuel economy perspective, when it ends its useful life, there's still a lot of capacity left in a battery. And so we want to definitely figure out how do we design for, you know, upfront design for remanufacturing or reuse so that it's easy to be able to use the parts. And there are some uh, applications where people are moving those into stationary opportunities or some maybe, maybe not so taxing kind of operations. But it's not a, it's not very definitive right now on who are the buyers of that material at this point. The second thing is um, uh, how do we recycle it? So when it gets through its secondary use, how do we recycle it? And that's still being uh, figured out as well. There's a lot of plastics and metals, of course, and electronics that can be recycled. People know how to do that. But there is a project, I think, out of the DOE that's looking at the cell materials, cathode material recycling. It still haven't concluded, which means we're still trying to figure it out, um, but that still is work yet to be done. So excellent question, lots of work to be done in that area. And we do want to be a part of that, of those solutions. Great, yeah, th thanks. I think that's, uh, you know, one of the the open things that I, as I look out there, I'm like, my gosh, this is, there's a lot of material floating around. So I'll, I'll catch you later on that in a more in a more deep way. So I think you guys can all see the questions too. Is there anyone that pops out that that's one that you really want to uh, uh, sort of address, uh, or should I just pick one? I can see. Just go ahead and pick one. Sure. Okay. So um, actually, actually, before you go, Jay, I think uh, there was one I could add to something what Denise said earlier uh, for next generation technologies, uh, sure. especially just quick. Uh, update, I mean, feedback to that one. As, as we all know, the bar has been set very, very high by lithium ion technologies with respect to durability and cost targets. As a result, all these technologies, we are of course working with solid state batteries or any other technology that's up and coming. However, like I mentioned, the bar has been set so high that these, these technologies have yet to prove that it meets the durability and will meet the cost target. So it is, not in the next year or, say, or the year after that, it's probably in the next five, 10 years that you will see some of those come in small samples, you know, not the full-fledged vehicle programs, maybe they'll find some niche application at the beginning and then find their way, you know. Got That's it. what I add two cents to that one. Great, uh, thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, so this one comes from Reed McManigal from uh, CMU, and it's, uh, do you anticipate a move away from silicon-based power electronics on EVs to wider band gap bass power electronics um, on what time frame? Uh, what are the key drivers for this decision? So we're talking about more efficient, smaller, uh, you know, power electronics based on alternative 3.5 semiconductors, for example. Are you guys looking at any of that? Or are you still sort of on the silicon bandwagon in terms of integrating um, basically um, based on heritage and cost? Well, unfortunately, I'm not the power electronics expert. Uh, we probably have to uh, go to some of our other uh, okay. friends around that one. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe you guys were like, uh, I thought maybe Greg, Greg had done some power electronics integration uh, uh, design. Fair enough. So I uh, got it. Um, okay, perfect. Um, but actually, I'll take a, a stab at one, Jay. So I'm, I'm sure. seeing here the, the question from Greg Ham. Yeah, I was about to ask that one, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and right, I'll, I'll reread the question, right? So charging as a major catch-22, people want a five-minute charge in order to buy a car, but they find that charging at home is cheaper and more convenient. Uh, this makes it hard to justify the cost of a public fast charger, and how do we navigate this? And I think that's a fantastic question. And quite honestly, I don't think there's one solid answer. Unfortunately, I am in, uh, I actually am a PHEV driver, and I plug in and charge at home, and I'm fortunate enough to plug in and charge at work. And I have driven dedicated EVs as well. 
and occasionally sought out fast charging. Uh, fast charging is seen by people in the industry as a barrier uh, to getting people under conventional IC engine vehicles into an, an electric. But the reality is living with a high mile EV, it is much easier, cheaper to, to charge at home. You don't drive much more than 30 to 40 miles in a day. <clears throat> Even for those who drive an excessively long drive like I do, um, you still have that opportunity where you're almost, all your drive is either electric uh, for, for any one of the long range EVs in the market. And quite honestly, public <laughs> fast charging is something I think that is gonna end up being, you know, industry and government funded. Uh, you know, Tesla put their bank of superchargers out there, uh, which is fantastic from a mobility standpoint. And it's a fantastic selling point for a vehicle, but fast charge itself is seen as this barrier to entry, but it's honestly, I agree, it is a quandary because the investment necessary for a large deploy, national deploy of fast charging, uh, really gets into more governmental, uh, big industry, um, right? Whether that's people like, uh, whether that's industry consortiums or EPRI or Argonne, and there's a lot of people working to solve that. Uh, but I agree with you, investing, trying to talk a municipality into investing into a fast charger is a difficult thing because there's probably not gonna be a lot of use yet. And you can charge at home really cheaply and easily. So as a person who has like a seven kilowatt level two charger at my house, super easy to plug in and really convenient. And generally you can charge in two to three hours what you drove for a day. It's really when you need to go long distances. So I think if we do any work in fast charging, it needs they need to be strategically deployed so that more people can have access and uh, that, that increases the mobility of, of a vehicle like that. I think to, to even leverage your, your statements there, Greg, I think um, as we look to uh, Europe and look to China, um, from a global finding the right sweet spot when it comes to infrastructure, I think those uh, those solutions are going to be born. And I think uh, the U.S. will be able to uh, take a look at various um, uh, strategies around the world on how to deal with that. And I think, quite frankly, if somebody figures out how to make some money on this one, I think uh, it'll be a very plentiful uh, opportunity. What's the, a good business model when it comes to charging? Got it. And, and I have a follow on uh, question from the audience. This was a uh, actually a, a pre question from David uh, Altair EV Fleet Energy uh, Altair Eco Village LLC. I'm not so sure exactly where that is, but thank you for the question, David. Um, and it's uh, this actually has to do with uh, can we are you guys working with and maybe this is outside your purview, but I'm curious if you have talked about it with GM or with government. Uh, it has to do with integrating um, EVs with the grid. Uh, can uh, do you think about at all grid integration and larger uh, larger questions around strengthening it versus weakening it? And will, do you think utilities are going to welcome car charging, or are you finding that siting um, and integrating uh, a large number, even even ten percent, the number you were talking about, is a fair amount of change in electrical you know consumption in the U.S. Do, do you guys see any integration or talk of, around the utilities, or is this sort of pushed? to more of the automotive folks or beyond? Well, I hear um, the automotive folks talk about it more with these agencies, obviously, because they have a, a better view on uh, where their vehicles are gonna be sold, um, what their target audience is or customer base is. So I see the, tech, the discussions happening more on the vehicle side with the utilities, but, um, but we are a part of those as well, maybe not as direct as the automotive uh, companies. And this is where I think, um, again, some of the time I spent in uh, working with OEMs in China, um, where uh, the state grid and the OEMs and the cell suppliers uh, worked a little closer on uh, understanding where that integration can go, understanding how to meet that need and taking a look at uh, sending the technology into both areas, doing some analysis, some, some, um, some field evaluations to see uh, what might uh, possibly be the right balance mm -hmm. of uh, integration. Uh, we always talked about um, uh, the vehicle being a part of the, you know, the V to grid, uh, the V to G, right. you know, that's yeah, yeah. always been a part of the buzz over the last decade. And, and how can these vehicles help uh, when it comes to load leveling, or if there's an emergency. So those discussions are out there. I think now as our, but our volumes were small. 
I think as the volumes get bigger, I think as we look towards 2025 and 2030, it's not something that we would just casually talk about. I think we really have to talk about it. And I think that the conversations and discussions uh, will become a lot more earnest. Southern California Edison did a lot of work in this area. I remember uh, back in the day. So I just think it's still, still in the early stage, but I think it's gonna increase uh, over time. Great. Thanks. And so I'm going to do one more question. This, this one just came in from Andrew uh, Shi. Um, and it's, and, and this is, I can elaborate a bit more, but how important is supply chain localization for the production of these cells and packs? Uh, you know, from my understanding, especially some of the, you know, the cathode or functional materials and some of the key other things like electrolytes and so forth, basically are not sourced within the U.S. They come in and they're integrated in the, in the battery cells and packs here. Uh, I'm wondering, are you guys um, looking for an increase in, or, or lithium, for example, lithium extraction and refinement uh, that is typically international too, and it may be, uh, uh, there may be some economic uh, risk with that as well. Are you guys looking to, um, you know, as a company, as LG, uh, looking to incentivize or to encourage more US-based supply chain, supply chain localization far upstream? Or is this something that you basically think you've got it? You've got it locked in. You're a huge company already, and you've got a supply chain uh, pretty much streamlined. Not locked in. Um, I think those are always opportunities for um, optimization around the world. Um, I even remember when I was at GM, we uh, worked with all the battery suppliers, and we even worked with some of the sub suppliers as well, just trying to cultivate the discussion and to, to figure out where might we go, what are the opportunities. So there still is opportunity. In fact, one of the biggest steps was having battery manufacturing on US soil. From, from a long time, we would uh, bring those batteries on a, on a slow boat from wherever. And um, back in 20, uh, 2009 with the Recovery Act, the US government and the state government and the OEMs and suppliers band together and voila, LG Chem had battery manufacturing in Holland, Michigan. Yep. And now LG Chem with GM will have battery manufacturing in Lordstown, Ohio. Um, and, and other suppliers were doing the same thing. So localization of the battery manufacturing here in the States was step one. And you're absolutely right. Uh, localization of some of the suppliers for some of those components is the next step. And it's coming not as fast as we all wanted it to come but it is coming and there's a lot of discussions around that and partnering. In fact, I was with uh, on a call a couple of uh, months ago with some other agencies here in the, in the United States working with other countries and figuring out how do we bring some of that supply chain here to the States and vice versa. So, um, and then also in Europe, uh, LG Chem has four major locations, uh, obviously in Korea, but also in uh, the United States was the second a location for LG Chem around the world to, to create that footprint, uh, footprint in Poland um, as well and China. So localization of manufacturing of batteries and then obviously the supply chain is a necessity. Absolutely. Thank you. That was a fantastic hour. Uh, I could go on uh, as a true battery nerd. I could go on for another three hours. Unfortunately, our hour is, is over. Uh, gosh, I really appreciate all your time. Uh, Anna tells me that you guys, uh, those who attended now have a poll for this webinar. If you could take a couple seconds to fill out this poll, it will help us do our job better as we push out more content like this. Um, and with that, Anna, do I need to say anything else? Maybe you should take over and thank everybody and say goodbye. And uh, I have a, a, you know, but but GLG people don't go away. Well, it's a closed door meeting here in a couple seconds. I wanna catch up with you guys some more, okay? Anna? And uh, I, I actually don't know how to turn my camera back on. I successfully <laughs> got it turned off and don't know how to turn it on. But thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jay, Denise, Mohammed. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Gregory as well, of course. Uh, much appreciated and look forward to seeing you all at future sessions. Thank you so much to our speakers and um, have a good rest of the day. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. And speakers, there's a, there's a different link on your calendar for the follow on meeting. So maybe take five minutes and we'll see you guys in like five there. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.